Oh my god, it's, it's almost like he's going bah! <laughs> So today I'm gonna bring you guys along to model a holiday themed serving tray using Shaper 3D on my iPad. And then we're gonna take that model, export it into Fusion 360 to get it set up to carve on my brand new CNC, which I am just really excited about. Now this video is not sponsored by any of these programs I'm using. This is actually my usual workflow. And if you guys wanna completely skip the design process and head straight to the CNC section, I'm gonna have timestamps below to help you out with that. And I also have the link in the descriptions to the 3D model on my website. And if you choose to purchase that model, I want to thank you in advance for supporting my channel, which allows me to do what I love to do, and that's bringing you guys these kind of tutorials. So with that said, let's start designing. And the first thing I'm going to do is look for an image to help me get started. So let's go into Google and look for cute reindeer head. Now I could draw something on my own, but that's not what this video is about. Um, right off the bat, I already like this first picture, so let's go into it. And uh, so this is a digital image sold by Jose Rivera. Um, let's tap on that and let's take a screenshot of it. And I'm gonna crop this down so that the edge of the image touches the edge of the line as close as possible. I'll show you why in a moment. Yeah, I just want to say that if I was making this serving tray to sell and make a profit, I will 100% buy this digital file from Jose, but for the purpose of this video where I'm mainly focused on 3D modeling and CNC, I'm just going to go ahead and use the screenshot and leave a link to his store in the descriptions. Um, so yeah, let's uh, go ahead and save that and let's launch Shaper 3D. Come up here, click on start designing and then new design. So I usually work in metric, that's why I have my units set to millimeters, but you can come up here and change it to whatever units that you like to use. I also like to lock my grid size to one millimeter, just for the heck of it. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is import the image that we just saved. So come up here to this icon with the down arrow, click on photos and click on the image that we just saved. Once it's loaded, we can start moving around with these arrows. Um, let's go to the top view by clicking this top surface on the navigation cube. And I'm gonna rotate this image 90 degrees like that. And I'm gonna set the height to 450 millimeters, which is roughly 18 inches. So let's zoom out. And I'm gonna move this image to the right quadrant and click done. Uh, last thing I'm going to do is set the opacity of this image to 25%. Something like that. So you can see what I'm doing later on. Um, let's exit out of that. And so this is why we cropped the image earlier before we saved it. It just makes it a lot easier to size and position it without needing to worry about all the white space around it. Um, so yeah, now we're ready to actually start modeling. Uh, let's start with the head first. So let's come under the sketch menu. And there's a couple ways to do this. One is to use the spline tool. And then we can just kind of trace along our image like this. But then we will have to come back and adjust each of these control points to smooth things out, which you know can be kind of tedious. So instead, what I'm gonna do is use the ellipse tool and we're gonna draw an oval like this. And the size and position doesn't matter right now, um, but we do wanna make sure that the long axis is horizontal, which you'll know once it snaps in place like this, or when you see this purple line appear. So uh, something like that, and then let's move this center point to kind of match where the center line of our image is like that, and then we can start adjusting the size of these dimensions. So let's make that shorter, and then this one longer, something like that, uh, maybe. Yeah, something like that. Um, now, before we continue drawing, we need to define a center axis so that everything that we draw from this point forward is going to line up and be symmetrical. And we're gonna do that using this oval that we just drew. So let's pick the line tool, and we're gonna draw a line from the center point of our oval, and make sure that it's vertical, which we'll know once we see this little icon with the vertical line inside it. Uh, let's select this line and make it into a construction line. Uh, this way this line is not going to affect the way the rest of the sketch is going to extrude later on. Um, so once we have that, let's go back to our ellipse tool and we're going to draw an oval starting from this line. And make sure once again that the long axis is horizontal and then we can come in and start adjusting the size of this oval.
And we might have to zoom in here so that the point's not going to try to snap to the other sketch. So maybe make that a little bit longer. So yeah, something like this. Um, now we can go and select our trim tool and remove the lines that we no longer need. And the last thing I'm going to do is drag across this whole sketch to select all the points and lines. And I'm going to select this lock constraint down here. This way the lines and points won't move. And the reason why we do this is because once we trim these ovals, the program actually sees these as splines. So if later we accidentally shift something, the lines won't be symmetrical anymore. So it's always a good idea to lock things down once we're happy with a portion of the sketch. Um, anyway, now we're just left with this transition between the head and the cheeks. Now I wish Shaper 3D had some kind of a sketch fillet tool where I could just add fillets in these corners, but they don't. So I'm just gonna leave it the way it is for now. And we're gonna come back to smooth out these corners after we've extruded the part into 3D bodies. Um, so now let's start working on the ears. Now for the tip of the ear, I'm gonna use a circle tool to get a nice, even, smooth curve. Let's move that to place. And if you don't like how this thing's snapping to the grid, um, just come down to this magnet tool here and uncheck these. So I'm gonna unselect all of these because it's gonna be even more pain in the once we start working with splines. Um, so now once we do that, we can move this a lot more freely. So now let's uh, change the dimensions and the position as well. And let's lock that in place. So for the rest of the ear, I'm going to use a arc tool. And in case you don't know, um, on the iPad, the line slash arc tool defaults to a straight line. But if I shake the pencil really quick, it turns into an arc. If I shake it again, it turns into a straight line, which is pretty cool. Um, so let's undo that. Now I'm going to put a line on the circle, shake it to turn into an arc, and then end it on the head. Now I'm gonna pick this arc and the circle, and I'm gonna come over here and select the tangent constraint. Now, no matter how I move these points, this arc will remain tangent to the circle, which is really important because this will guarantee that the transition between these two different curves will remain as smooth as possible. That way we won't be left with some sharp edges that's gonna cause us problems later down the road, either when we're trying to extrude the sketch or during the cam setup. Um, anyway, now let's adjust this arc to better match our image. So something like this. Um, and I'm just gonna change these values to whole numbers just because I'm OCD like that. Okay, now let's do the same thing to the other side. So put a start point on the circle, turn that into an arc, and put the end point on the head. And make sure that this arc and the circle are tangent to one another. And let's change that to whole numbers. That. Now we're going to take the trim tool and trim away the line that we don't need. Um, okay, now let's zoom out and I'm going to select everything and lock it down. So another feature I wish Shaper 3D had was the ability to mirror sketches. That way I can just take this ear and mirror it to the other side of the sketch, um, which is another thing that we can't really do until we have the 3D bodies extruded. Um, it's not really a big deal, but I usually like to do as much as possible within sketches before extruding them into bodies. So I just think that a sketch mirror function would be really nice to have. Um, but yeah, anyway, I digress. Um, let's move on to the antlers. So we're gonna follow same process and we're going to use circles to define these tips. Let's zoom in here and draw three circles. And then we can come in here and start uh, setting the dimensions and positions to match the image. And then let's lock them down as we go. Oh yeah, you can also lock things down by clicking this little lock icon down here instead of coming all the way to the right side. But um, yeah, so once we have this, uh, we can start drawing the rest of the antlers, which has a lot of curves to them. So we're gonna use the spline tool. And there's two ways to control the curvature of the spline. One is to use control and the other one is fit. Feel free to try out both of them, but for this example, I'm gonna use control. So just like with the ear, I'm gonna start at the circle and just kind of follow along the image the best I can and 
end it at the head. Now I'm going to select the spline and the circle, make them tangent to one another, and then start dragging around these control points to smooth things out and follow the curve of the image better. So, something like this. So once that looks good, I'm going to select this whole thing and I'm going to lock it down. Now let's look at this next corner, which you can see is really tight. So this is a little bit tricky because I plan to cut out this entire profile using this amount of quarter inch down cut bit that I got from Tools Today. Um, so in metric, the diameter of this is about 6.3 millimeters or maybe 6.4. So I need to make sure that none of these gaps are ever less than that. I'm gonna do that by drawing two circles that are 6.5 millimeters in diameter like this. And I'm going to make each one of these tangent to this other circle that I have. For now, I'm just going to leave these free floating. And then I'm going to go back to the spline tool and connect this top circle with this bottom one like this. And then let's make this spline tangent to all three circles. So we have to do these individually like this. Now let's tweak things around. And as we tweak these points, we need to make sure that uh, this gap never gets smaller than these two circles. So something like this. But um, I actually don't like how this looks. I like how in the original image, this gap gets smaller here and then it opens up at the bottom. So I'm going to set this one to 7 and this lower one to 9 like that. And then let's tweak this around some more. Something like this. Yeah, I like how that looks. So let's lock these two circles down and now we can tweak this. Okay, now let's go to the trim tool and get rid of these lines that we no longer need. Something like that. Okay, um, the rest of the antler is pretty much done the exact same way, so I'm just gonna speed up the video and finish up this section. And let's lock everything down. Okay, so that was a really long section, but we just finished the most difficult part of the modeling process. Now all we have to do is extrude the sketch into 3D bodies, which I promise it's gonna be much quicker. Um, so let's exit the sketch, and we are going to extrude the face up 25 millimeters, like that. And then remember these sharp edges that we ignored earlier where the head and the cheeks met? Well, now we can go ahead and pick these sharp edges and we are going to pull away to smooth that out. And let's set that to 30 millimeters. Pretty easy, right? Okay, now to create the pocket in the face, we are going to come under Tools and select Offset Edge. And make sure the type is selected as loop. This way we can pick the entire boundary with one click, just like this. And we're gonna offset that six millimeters inward and click done. Now we're gonna push this new face down 12 millimeters. Okay, um, let's go ahead and extrude the ear and the antler as well up to 25 millimeters. And to mirror these two over to the other side of the head, let's double click to select both of them and then come under more and pick mirror. Now we're going to select the center line that we used on our previous sketch. And the center line is going to create this plane that the two bodies are going to mirror about just like this. Make sure the keep originals is on and click done. Now if we come under our design tree, we can see that we have five separate parts. So we want to merge them into one. Um, we can do that by clicking this union function. And make sure the keep originals is off this time and click done. So now we've got this single part, which is great because we're going to come in here and pick all of these sharp edges where the separate parts join together. 
yeah, there's a bunch of edges, but we're going to pick them all and we're going to pull to smooth them out. Let's go back to a top view. Um, and I'm going to set the radius to five millimeters like that. So this ensures that these corners can be cut using our quarter inch diameter bit, which has a radius of about 3.1, 3.2 millimeters. Um, but anyway, we have our general shape now and we can start setting this up in cam, but he kind of looks really boring. Like, like, any old tray that you can get off of Etsy right now. So I want to add some eyes and nose to him. Um, so yeah, let's give that a try. First, I'm gonna need a center line. So let's project our old center line from the previous image onto our new plane. Um, let's make this into a regular line because we can't project construction lines. Now let's exit the sketch and come under more and select project. Um, make sure that the projection type is set to sketches. And then let's pick this surface. Now click done. Um, let's go to our design tree and hide any other sketch planes that we're not currently using just to avoid drawing on the wrong plane later on. Let's close that and then let's double tap on the surface. And first thing I'm gonna do is select this line, lock it down and turn it into a construction line. Oh yeah, let's exit the sketch real quick. Another thing I wanna do is move our reference image up to the surface. So I think that's 13 millimeters from the original position. And now let's double tap on that surface and use the ellipse tool to draw an oval for the nose. Oops, one thing I forgot to do is turn the snap functions back on because we need that in order to make sure that our ovals long axis is horizontal. So like that. Okay, now let's Let's move the center point onto the center line and let's adjust the dimensions. Okay, perfect. Um, now let's use the circle tool to draw two circles for the eyes. And to make these two symmetrical, let's pick the center point and then pick the symmetry constraint and then select the center line. So now, no matter how I move one of these circles, the other one's gonna move in relation to it. Um, another thing I wanna do is select both circles and make them equal to one another. That way, when I change the dimensions of one, the other is gonna change with it. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now let's exit the sketch and I'm gonna hide the uh, reference image and let's select all three surfaces and pull it down two millimeters like that. See how that looks. It <laughs> Oh my god, is it me or does this thing just oozes some kind of creepy energy? It's almost like it's going bah! <laughs> oh my god, oh. I'm not giving up yet, guys. Let's undo this and hopefully erase it from our memories. And let's go back to our sketch. So instead of this oval being the nose, let's make that the, uh, the muzzle. So we're gonna use the ellipse tool again and draw another oval like this. And this is gonna be our nose. Let's change the dimensions. Let's make that 15 and let's shift that down a little bit, something like that. Um, now I'm gonna switch over to the line arc tool and I'm gonna draw an arc to give him a little, a little smirk, right? To make him friendlier looking. Let's change that a little bit. Let's do 65 maybe. And let's move that around change the angle a little bit. Um, so something like this. Um, if we want to cut this smirk with the same quarter inch bit, we need to offset this edge like 6.5, which uh, it's a little wider than I want. Um, so let's undo that. I want to offset that like less than that. So 3.5 maybe. Yeah, that looks much better. So I'm going to close this off with two straight lines. And 
Okay, let's exit the sketch. I'm gonna offset this muzzle down three millimeters. I think the nose looks pretty good with it being raised like that, but I want the lips to go down an additional two millimeters, like that. So let's hide our sketch, and we're gonna zoom in here and pick these sharp edges in the corners. And we're gonna round them out. So half of 3.5 is 1.75. Let's bring back our sketch and go back to a top view. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, <laughs> much better, right? Um, I'm definitely gonna need to do something with the eyes, but before I do that, I want to mention that because we added this three and a half millimeter pocket, we basically just add an additional operation to our CNC because in order to cut this, we need to switch over to a one eighth inch bit. So if I'm producing this to sell, I'm probably gonna change the design so we can cut as much as possible with our quarter inch bit. Um, yeah, this is just something to keep in the back of your mind as you're designing stuff like this. But for this project I really like the way this looks so I'm gonna go with it um, so for the eyes I'm gonna turn them into ovals something like that and I'm gonna rotate a little bit because I think it adds a little bit more to the smile let's change these dimensions so something like that and I'm gonna move this away slightly um, so I only made one eye because I can select this and use the move rotate tool and select copy and move a copy to the other side. Now deselect copy and rotate this one so that it roughly mirrors what the other eye is doing. It doesn't have to be perfect because I'm gonna come in here and turn this eye into a wink. And I'm gonna do that by using the offset edge tool. Now pick this eye and pull this in three and a half millimeters. Now let's switch to the line arc tool and close off the ends using a couple lines. So zoom in here and make sure that these lines are connected to the actual ovals and not one of these control points. Because that's the only way we can use the trim tool to get rid of the extra lines that we don't need. So something like that. Now let's pick our new surfaces. And we're going to push them in 3 millimeters. Let's come to the design tree, hide our sketch. And then we're gonna come in here and pick these sharp edges in the corners like we did with the mouth. And we are going to round these corners out 1.75 millimeter radius. Okay, um, let's do the same thing to this other eye and round out the bottom edge. And we can actually keep increasing this to form like a dish shape on the bottom, which um, I think looks a lot better than a flat bottom. Depends on what you want, I guess. Um, okay, now let's do the same thing to the nose as well. So select the top edge of the nose and let's increase the radius until it turns into a dome shape, something like that. And we're gonna add a smaller radius on this bottom edge. All right, um, oh, for the muzzle, let's do a six millimeter radius for the bottom edge and let's do a smaller three millimeter radius for this top edge. And this looks so much better, guys. It's got a little wink and a little smirk. It's just so much friendlier, and I'm really liking the way this looks. Um, yeah, so I figure we were already using this 1 8 inch bit to cut the mouth, so why not use it to cut the wink as well? Um, anyway, all we have left to do now is to round over the sharp edges around the outer boundaries. So let's start with this inside bottom edge. So let's select that and let's pull that to eight millimeters. And the radii for the lip is really limited by the thickness of the lip. So I think when we did this, the thickness was six millimeters. Okay, for some reason it's saying it's 5.9988. Um, so this means that the radius for each edge can't go over three millimeters. Um, so let's pick both edges. Yeah, see when it goes to three, it says blend with overlap. So I think the highest we can set is like 2.9, which, you know, it's fine. Okay, so our model is now done. I know it's still kind of hard to see what this model looks like. So what we can do is come over to visualization 
and apply a material on it to get a render of what this would look like in real life. So let's look for, yeah, so let's, uh, this American walnut veneer, let's put that on there. And actually that looks really good, guys. Oh man, the modeling is finally done. I really didn't think it was gonna take this long, but we are now finally ready to move on to setting up the CNC. So let me show you guys how to export this file to the computer. So come up here to the icon with the up arrow and then go under format. Next, we're gonna save this as a step file. So click on that and then we can give it a name like serving tray. <laughs> and click continue. So there's a couple ways to send this to your computer. The way I normally do it is go under share with and then airdrop it to my computer like this. Um, you can also email it to yourself or just save it to the cloud. But yeah, once we're done with that, let's put away Shaper 3D and launch Fusion 360. So a lot of the steps I'm gonna show here will be similar to what I've already covered in my previous video. I'm still gonna show you all of my settings for each of the steps, but this time I'm just not gonna go into depth explaining what each of those settings do. So if you wanna get more details about that, definitely check out my other video here. Um, okay, so once Fusion 360 is launched, go up to File, Open, and then Open from my computer. And then let's go to the place where we save the file and double click to open it up like that. Now let's switch from the design workbench over to the manufacturer workbench. And then go under Setup, we will create a new setup. And under the Setup tab, my operation type is set to milling because we're using the CNC. My stock point is gonna be set to this lower left corner of the top surface. And then let's switch to the stock tab. So I've already glued up a panel to prepare for this tutorial because I knew roughly how big of a tray I wanted and how much extra material I needed around the outside. So I'm gonna change this mold to fixed size box and I'm gonna input the actual dimensions of the panel that I glued up, which was um, 350, oops by 500 by 26. And let's click OK to finish up the setup. So now we're ready to define our first operation, which if you've seen any of my previous videos, you already know it's gonna be a 3D adaptive clearing toolpath. And this is gonna help us to clear out the bulk of the material in the most efficient way. So let's come under 3D and we're gonna select adaptive clearing. And under tool, click select. And I'm gonna go under favorites and select this amount of quarter inch down cut bit that has a part number 46202-K. And I'm gonna click select. So here are my feed and speed values. Um, feel free to take a screenshot of that if you want. But we're gonna go under the geometry tab and under machine boundary, I'm gonna change that to selection and I'm gonna zoom in here and pick this top outer edge on the model. And I'm gonna keep rest machining checked and the source is set to from setup stock since this is our first operation. Um, so someone asked me from my previous video whether or not we need to keep rest machining on for the first operation since rest machining is only used for removing material that was left behind from the previous operations. But I've always enabled it because I thought it tells the following operations that this is our first step. And also if we don't need it, then why is there an option to set the source to from setup stock. Um, if someone knows, please let me know in the comments below, but for now, I'm gonna leave it on and let's come under the passes tab and I'm gonna change this maximum roughing step down to six millimeters and make sure the stock to leave option is checked and click okay to let the tool pads generate. Um, okay, so while this generates, obviously Fusion 360 is going to know that the quarter inch bit is too big to cut these three and a half millimeter wide slots. So what we're gonna do is define a new toolpath. So let's come up to 2D and then do a 2D pocket toolpath. Um, for the tool selection, come under favorites and I'm gonna use this Amano 1 8 inch down cut bit that has a part number 46225-K. Click select. And let's jump over to geometry and for the contour mode, I'm gonna change this to selected pockets. And for pocket selection, I will pick the bottom surface of these slots like that. Next, let's go to the passes tab. And I'm gonna change this maximum step over to 1.3, which is roughly 40% um, of the diameter of this bit. 
I'm gonna uncheck stock to leave because we're not gonna do any finishing passes on this operation. And we're gonna click OK to generate. There you go, that was pretty fast. Um, yeah, so here's our tool path, but we have a problem because all of this material was already cleared out in the previous operation. So there's really no reason to let the tool cut back and forth like that through air. It's a total waste of time. Um, so in my previous tutorial video, I pretty much ignored the heights tab because the default values were fine. But I think this is a perfect example to show what those settings are for and how to use it to fix this problem. Um, but before we start, let's right click on the operation and come down to machining time and see how long this is going to take. So about two and a half minutes, which I mean isn't too bad, but I think we can improve that a lot. So let's double click on this operation and jump over to the Heights tab. Um, here the top height is what tells the machine where to start cutting from. So by default, it's starting from the stock top, which is why the tool was cutting all the way from the top and starting to cut down as if we haven't removed all that material from the previous operation yet. So we're gonna change that to selected contours, which are the bottom surfaces of our pockets. So now this is saying we're gonna start cutting from the bottom surfaces of our pockets down to the bottom surfaces of our pockets. By design, we know that the pockets were three millimeters deep, and then there's an extra half millimeter of material left over from the previous operation. So we're gonna set that offset to 3.5 millimeters. So now it's saying to start the cut from three and a half millimeters above the selected contours, and we're gonna cut down to the selected contours. And let's click OK. So immediately you see that it's a lot better. It's coming down and then it's ramping a little bit before it cuts down to the material. It's skipping all of this material up top. So let's right click on this operation and check the machine time, 51 seconds. So we just reduced about 50%. Um, I think we can do even better. So let's double click on that and come to the linking tab. So here's something that's called a ramp clearance height, and by default, that's set to two and a half millimeters. What this means is that the tool is gonna to start ramping two and a half millimeters above our top height. And we're gonna change that to 0.5 instead, and click OK. So now you see the tool is gonna to come down and it's gonna start ramping. And before I finish the whole pass, it's already starting to cut into our material. So that's gonna be a lot more efficient Let's right click and our machine time's down to 38 seconds, which is really good because we basically just reduced the machining time by 70% without needing to change the feed and speed. Um, there's probably more I can do, but also probably not worth my time. Um, now let's move on to the finishing pass. So come under 3D and then select parallel. Now for the tool, Let's go to my favorites, and we're gonna use this 1 8 inch radius ball nose bit that has a part number 46294-K, and click select. And then I'm gonna make sure the coolant is disabled. Over in the geometry tab, I'm gonna change the machining boundary to selection, and for the boundary, I'm gonna pick this outer top edge. And make sure that rest machining is turned on, and the source should be from previous operations and the adjustment, change that to use as computed. Next, let's go to the passes tab and I'm gonna change the step over to 0.5 and click OK to generate. So I know I went through that pretty quick, but this is pretty much what I usually do for all of my finishing passes. And I've already gone over all of these settings in my previous videos. So if you want more details on what these settings are or why I chose the values I chose, I'm gonna leave links to those videos in the descriptions. Um, but yeah, once this is done generating, our final step is to cut this part out of the stock. So for that, I'm gonna come under 2D and then pick 2D contour. And for the tool, I'm gonna to go back to the quarter inch down cut bit that we used in the first operation. Click select. And then under the geometry tab for contour selection, this time I'm gonna pick the outer bottom edge of the model because I want the bit to travel all the way to the bottom of the part. Um, I'm gonna disable tabs because I'm gonna use double sided tape to hold this part down. And finally, under the passes tab, I'm gonna enable multiple depth. And then for this maximum roughing step down, I'm gonna set that to six millimeters. 
and click OK to finish our toolpaths. And now all that's left to do is the post process and get our G code. I actually recently got a brand new CNC in my shop. It's a Onefinity and I'm really excited to try it out for the first time on this project. Um, the post process procedure is gonna be pretty much the same as what I've done in the past, except this time I'll be using a different post processor and the machine control software is, it's actually pretty different. But anyway, to do this, let's come under actions and pick post process. So as I said, my post processor is now Onefinity. Next, go to the output folder to pick where we're saving the G code and mine's gonna be this little flash drive. And as I've said in my past videos, we need to save each of these operations separately because they involve tool changes. So the first one's gonna be our 3D adaptive and click post. And then let's pick the second operation and then go under actions again and click on post process. And this one will name it to the pocket. And then let's select parallel actions again, post process, and let's name it 3D parallel. And finally, we'll do that one last time for the 2D contour. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the last thing we need to do on the computer. Now we just need to load the G-code onto the CNC and get this guy carved. This guy came out so good and I'm so glad I made the changes to the eyes and the mouth. And I realized that even if I don't use this as a tray, it actually looks great just hanging on the wall like this. So if you guys wanna make one of these two and also support my channel, be sure to head over to my website to pick up the 3D model and have fun with it. Also, if you wanna learn more about how to set things up in Fusion 360 for 3D carving, be sure to check out this video here and don't forget to subscribe and like, and I will see you guys in the next video.